So it's plus two times negative one minus C one over two minus two minus two minus C one minus two. We have minus four, add to the other side is four, two C1 minus C1 is one C1. And very quickly we'll get C2 by plugging this right back into the first equation. Negative one minus four over two, which is negative one minus two, negative three. No, this isn't, oh yeah, so we got C1 is four, C2 is negative three, and we should have gotten C3 somewhere else. Hopefully, yeah, so C3 is one. So we got all of our three constants here. We'll collect them all together in the right form, which won't let me zoom out far enough. We'll just rewrite it here. E to the X plus C1 is four. So four over two is two x squared c2 is negative 3 and c3 is 1. So there is our particular f of x right there that satisfies all conditions that we started with. So we had three unknowns or three parameters so we needed at least three conditions. So not every condition is going to be useful. There are useless initial conditions. I'll try not to give them to you overall. Uh, let's look at one example of a useless initial condition. So there are useless initial conditions. And we'll go with the same problem we were doing. What would I get if I had y quadruple derivative of 0 equals 1? So I think we had everything, none of ours used derivatives. But what if I had y triple prime of 0 equals 1? I'm going to use this original f of x right here. So we had f of x is e to the x. e x plus c1 over 2x squared plus c2x plus c3. What is f quadruple prime of x? What happens to the polynomial part after three derivatives? It gets eliminated. Well, because it keeps decreasing degrees every derivative, so two derivatives, you'll have a constant term. Three derivatives, you'll have no terms. So it'll just be e to the x. So yes, I could plug in f triple prime of zero equals e to the zero, which, no kidding, equals one right there. So there are initial conditions, conditions that don't get you any more information. Now, <clears throat> if I, the initial condition was, was this was 7, then something went wrong. Either I have a bad solution or this initial condition won't actually work. So there are, uh, I will try not to give you any initial conditions that don't make any sense to plug in, uh, but there are certainly useless initial conditions. So the true general solution includes all possible solutions. So 
So example that we'll do a slightly different one. So this differential equation has an equal sign and derivatives. So it's differential equation. Y quadruple prime equals Y. So take four derivatives and get back to where you started. So let's think of different uh, solutions that will work for y. What's the first one? All right, guest solutions. And I'll, there's gonna be more than one, so let's go with y1 equals, all right, e to the x, derivative e to the x, e to the x, take more derivatives, e to the x. So that works. Cosine? Cosine will work, because derivative of cosine sine, derivative of sine is cosine. Negative, somewhere there's negative that creeps in. Yeah, if you do four derivatives, so your negative gets applied twice. Next. Oh, and these can be multiplied by constants as well. So we'll go c1e to the x. That won't change the derivatives. The derivatives will be c times, just a constant multiple rule. So if some function worked in this particular problem, constant multiple times that function will work also. So we'll go with c2 cosine x. How about sine? The sine is cosine, cos is negative sine. Negative cosine. Yeah, it'd be negative cosine. Wait, whatever, it'd be negative cosine. Negative sine. Yes, do that. Oh, yeah, one more. Sine, no. I think it works, because it goes, so first derivative is cos. Negative sine. We could bring the negative outside and then basically apply it two more. So we'll go sine to cos, cos to sine, and we'll get back to regular sine. So sine should work also. Now, there is the y equals zero solution in this problem. Doesn't always work, but how could I cover this solution with the y1 I already chose? What is constant value could I use? So if I say c1 is 0, I'll have covered the y equals 0, 1. So this would be redundant. So I don't need this one. Now, how good is your memory from calculus 2? Hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic cosine, their derivatives never turn negative. That is y4, y5. Hyperbolic cosine had similar property. Uh, derivatives, derivative of hyperbolic cosine is hyperbolic sine. Derivative of hyperbolic sine is hyperbolic cosine. There's no negatives that go in there. So our general solution You're going to add all these y's together. So we add all these together, and that's called the general solution. So we have c1e to the x plus c2 cos x plus c3 sine x plus c4 hyperbolic sine x plus c5 hyperbolic cosine. All right. Now, assuming there were no more solutions, that was it, this would be the general solution. You throw in every single possible solution into there. and. In this particular case, we're allowed to do multiples because of the way the original differential equa equation was set up.
So when we add up our solutions, it won't, you won't always be able to add them up, but whenever your ODE is linear, this will work. So the summation of solutions is a solution. when the ODE is linear. So what in the world is a linear ODE? So we know ordinary differential equation, we have some idea of linear. What did linear mean before? No like squares or yeah, no squares, no square roots. So it was just basically constant times variable plus other constant times, other variable. So a linear ODE, is constant times variable plus constant times variable plus you can also allow constant times uh, derivative of a variable or derivative of a derivative of a variable but not variable squared or cubed or square rooted so a linear ODE is an ODE obviously where all of your yk are all first powers. And I don't think I used the parenthesis derivative notation this quarter, but if you have lots of derivatives or an arbitrary number, So where yk equals ddx, 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 k times. Which of course you can also write with an exponent like that. So just apply ddx, k times. This would have been a reasonable thing to do instead of writing prime, 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 prime like we did before on that last example we did. We did y quadruple prime equals y. It would have been reasonable to use a four right there. I think four primes is about the limit of where it stops. This starts to be silly. If you write five primes, you, you want to do like a tally. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Certainly, after that, it becomes a little crazy. So four is about my limit to where it doesn't make sense to use primes anymore. All right, so why are higher powers bad if we're going to add up solutions? So this will, I'll show you why squared is bad, but it, it'll be it will fail for similar reasons if you got cubed or fourth and something similar happens with the square root as well or other roots. So we're going to suppose that F and G are solutions. So we'll just suppose there's two solutions instead of five to make the math work out a little bit nicer. It fails with two. All right, easy question. What is f plus g, k, the k derivative of f plus g? Two functions add together, take k derivatives. All right, what if I just took one derivative? What would I get? Some rule, so f prime plus g prime. If I took another derivative, I could do the same thing. So f plus g doing k derivatives, 
fk plus gk. So derivative works just fine with addition. But f plus g squared, well, let's write out of x of x. So notation is not too ambiguous. So if I square fx plus gx, I'll get fx fx plus outside inside 2 fx gx plus gx gx. So these will look very different right here. So if it's linear, your derivative basically distributes across f plus g. If you're squaring or cubing, you're going to get all these uh, intermediate terms, not just first one squared plus last one squared. You get all these intermediate ones. And that's the reason that adding up solutions only works if your ODE is linear. Our next topic is direction fields. And we're going to switch to a graph paper. So we'll begin with the function y equals f of x. Or you could use the implicit function, f of x, y equals 0. Now in this implicit one, where y is a function of x, for x inside some interval a to b. And this interval will be the domain of f. So you can start out with either a function, y is a function of x, or an implicit function where you cut down the domain to something small. So you actually get a function out of it, or y is a function of x. Now, what in the world am I talking about? So what's the graph of this implicit function? So a circle radius 1. And we could define y as a function of x. For x, we do have to limit x values or y values sometimes as well. Uh, so I could write, I could solve for y. y squared equals, we'll add 1, subtract x squared y equals plus or minus 1 minus x squared. So I do have a function if I get very specific and say x is between negative 1 and 1, and I have to choose is y positive or negative. So if I make a choice, if I go with positive 1 minus x squared, uh, I'm not choosing the x interval, but x will be between uh, negative 1 and 1. 
So I can take an implicit function and get a function by restricting significantly down the x's and or the y's. So in this case, I had to restrict the y's. We'll go cd, and this will be the range of f. So y prime is the slope of the function. So we saw this before. So if we have a first order ODE, we're going to begin with this particular ODE, y prime equals some function of x and y. And x is in some interval a to b. So what this tells us, without applying any calculus to this, this right here tells us the slope at any point x, y. So without doing any fancy calculus stuff, just this information tells us what is the slope at every, any point x, y in the domain. Now it tells us the slope of y. So y prime tells us the slope of y. Which is the solution. So we could solve for y, but without doing any calculus, all we really know about y is the slope of y. We can still graph the uh, slopes and they graph into what's called a direction field or a slope field. And that's what we're looking at in this section. So it's called the direction field or slope field. So I've used directionfield.com to graph these. I will have you graph your own direction field. You can't use directionfield.com, so you use this like a checking tool, not a how to get it tool. So I will, we're going to graph two examples here, and we'll do the first one completely by hand. The first one will be a little bit easier. So our first one, y prime equals 2x. So just looking at this, y prime doesn't depend on y. It only depends on what x is. We'll graph from, let's do negative 2 to positive 2 for x and y. And I'm not going to label numbers on here. Actually, I'll, let me do, I'll do 3 and negative 3. Or I'm not going to go all the way out to those. I just don't want to. I'm going to be drawing a lot. At every single integer point, I'm going to be drawing a slope field. So I don't want to fill up the middle with numbers. So I'm going to leave the middle empty. And we're going to start filling out some slopes. All right, what do we get when x equals 0? What is our slope? Zero. So when x is 0, our slope is 0. So that's a flat slope. 
So a slope of zero whenever x is zero. I'm going to use these five points right here. There's an infinite number of points in between, but I'm going to just draw these five points and the slopes. So all these slopes are flat or horizontal. So there's our horizontal slopes right there. What is our slope when, so that was x equals zero. What is our slope when x equals one? Uh, two. two. So graph little uh, line segments with slope two. And graph them on these five points here. And what is our slope when x equals positive 2? 4. It'll be 4. So you're just basically doubling your x coordinate, and that's your slope. And if I went over to the right more, it would just get steeper and steeper and steeper. Now we're going to go for negative 1. So plot your five points and graph the slope. And do the same thing in negative 2. So this is what your graph should look like, 25 little slopes. So this particular slope didn't depend on y. So every, uh, basically if you move, just look at your x values, you get these columns that all match up with the same slope. That was only because it wasn't, for example, two, time, or two times x times y. That would change things a lot. So it's only dependent on x's, so we got these sort of columns that were the same. If this only depended on y, we'd have gotten rows that had the same uh, slope going across. So here's how to think about slope field. Think about a river, and if a leaf or any object that floats falls in the river, this tells you the current. So if you know where that leaf lands, let's say it lands right here. So there's a leaf. Now you do have to know which way the river's flowing, to the right or to the left. Uh, let's assume it's going to the right, and it's going to then go that direction with the slope line. Now in between the two, I don't exactly know the path it's going to take. However, by the time the x-coordinate is zero, the path it's going to take is horizontal. So I have some intuition about the direction it's going to go. It's going to go down to the right, and then it's going to, at some point, stop going down and just to the right. So we can trace out. It's going to look something like, delete some of these. It's going to look something like that right there. And then as it keeps going to the right, it's going to increase its y value quite a bit. So we'll be going and tracing a path like this. And if a leaf falls in somewhere else, let's say a leaf falls in right here, what happens? It's going to trace out a path that's going to look like that. It's similar except just starts in a different spot. So the idea of initial condition is where the leaf lands. I only need a one initial condition because we had a, let's see, somewhere, first degree, first degree right here. So I only need a one, con one initial condition. So if you know where the leaf lands, you know the path it would trace out. Now a river's not the best example because a river, technically the slope feels not constant. It will ch it'll vary a little bit over time. If more water is ru rushing down or something moves in the river or something like that. Uh, though a river is not always, it doesn't always have exactly the same 
flow, uh, flow lines or direction lines. Same thing's true with the air conditions. Those change a whole lot more than, than water does. All right, so that was our first example. We'll do one more example now. So now y prime depends on both x and y. So I want you to do the same thing for the same x and y values, except your lines, your line segments are going to be very different. So same points, same x, y values, but slope, the line segments are going to look very different. And you do not get undefined when y equals 0. I mean, the number's undefined, but you can draw a line segment in there. So any questions on any of the slopes at the points here? There is actually one special point that doesn't actually have a slope. It's the origin. So I can talk about the slope at, let's see, 1, 0. At 1, 0. y prime equals negative 1 over 0. Normally, we would say this undefined, but we also know undefined as a vertical slope. So it's just telling you infinitely steep. That's all. There is a different problem at 0, 0. 0 over 0 is not necessarily undefined. You don't actually know what 0 over 0 is. It's actually worse than not 0 over 0 in some sense. Trying to be a zero slope and an infinite slope at the same time? There's, and yeah, there's a few ways to think about it. One way is, yeah, one way is it needs to both simultaneously be zero and be horizontal and vertical at the same time. So that's the first indication it's not going to work. <laughs> and let's look more carefully. If leaps fall in here, what pattern are they going to make? 
So let's drop a leaf somewhere easy. Let's drop it out here. There's our first leaf. Where's that leaf going to go? And let's say we're going uh, counterclockwise so we could be consistent with... Uh, what way did things drain in, in, this uh, in this hemisphere? I think it's counterclockwise. Right, let's just go counterclockwise. Okay, I don't spend enough time watching water go down drains. <laughs> All right, so it's going to start. It's going to go down or up, depending on which way it's going. But then it's going. If it's going down, it's going to start curving to the right. And eventually, when it gets to the y-axis, it's actually going to be going horizontal, directly to the right. So the shape is going to trace out. It's actually a circle. So it's not a spiral. It's going to be a circle, and it should. Oh, I can do better than that. All right, it's going to look something like that, and it will literally go around forever because it's going to end up exact same point that it started. So it's going to flow around in a circle forever. Same thing happens at one. Same thing happens at one half, even though we didn't draw the small uh, slope field right there. But the slope field still exists. It's just uh, we just didn't draw it. So you can see that leaf go right around the origin like that. You won't be able to tell which way they're going um, from the problem itself. Or from the equation itself, I should say. There need to be more information. There is one place a leaf could drop that it will trace out a path that's completely different than all the other paths. So almost, almost always going to be a circle. So what happens if the leaf falls in the very center? It's going to stay there. Yeah, it might spin, but uh, we're not really considering the orientation in terms of the rotation of the leaf as it moves around. That's more of a uh, torque physics-y kind of thing, so we'll just not worry about that. And we'll say if the leaf falls in the center, it doesn't move. So we won't consider the actual object rotating, just the position changing. So if it falls in the center, it won't move. And that is what we call singularity. Or, yeah, if it was a drain, well, that would require another, uh, a third dimension, a Z dimension, and we're not going to worry about that. So this is just a swirling two-dimensional vortex. Yet, or just we're not going to worry about that? In this class. Good you can worry about third dimension in real life, but not in this class. Or Calc 3, that's a good time to worry about the Z axis. <laughs> Calc 4. So x equals, or x, y is 0, 0. That is what we call a singularity. And I'll use a red. I'll use a red for that because it's different than all the other ones. So we'll pre more precisely define, oh, I guess we'll define singularity really soon. All right, let me just say it's a singularity now, and the intuitive definition is if a leaf falls there, it doesn't move. So it's just a single position, it's going to land there and stay. Another way to think about it, it doesn't look like the other uh, curves that get traced out. It's singular. So an ordinary point. Ooh, let me define integral curve first. And integral curve. <coughs> Is a curve traced out by a leaf? by a leaf in the direction field. They're represented by the green in the examples we did. So it's all the green curves. So 
that's an integral curve. And singular, oh, that's an integral curve, yeah. Now we have ordinary point. So an ordinary point, a point which lies on exactly one integral curve. So a singular point, there's two ways you could be a singular point. One way is a point which lies on more than one integral curve. Or it could be a point at the center of a closed loop. Do one last example. So y prime is going to be a step function now. So we're in piece one if x is not zero, piece two if x is zero. So we won't actually be dividing by zero in this direction field. And overall, x is going to be restricted to minus one, one, and y is going to be restricted to zero, two. So we'll graph this out. Same way we did before, except we only have to go negative one to one.
So I think this is the direction field we get. The lines on this are supposed to all actually meet at one point and look like this. I feel like I need to graph a few more of these points to see. So we'll graph this one on Monday on the direction field so grapher. On yeah, it was an example where all of the flow, all the curves meet at one point. And that would be a singular point where they all meet is a singular point. So I should probably draw that super intersection point in red. <laughs>